All right, I have an incredibly important question, arguably the most important question when it comes to the uh, rich and diverse history of Latin America, and that is, which Latin American country does the best grilled meat? <laughs> I think we have a relevant guest on the topic, yeah. and this is the reason that we brought him on, so please, <laughs> Ian, please. Start a civil war. This is not the most uh, delicate question you can uh, ask a Latin American. <laughs> if you ask uh, who plays the best soccer, who plays best football, yeah. uh, then we, will, we would get into a heated debate. Yeah, well, we don't want you to get killed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the best grilled meat, uh, the the Platinos, Uruguay, Argentina, uh, Rio Grande mm. do Sul, all three places, one in Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, they have the best grilled meat. Uh, I, I think that's not very arguable, but uh, I might be wrong. I will read the comments. I, I'm sure they will be very <laughs> polite and... and Balanced <laughs> as always. <laughs> How about you? Uh, you got like I, I'm. I have a feeling that you have incredibly strong opinions. Yes, no discussion. Serbian, Serbian barbecue on the Balkans. <laughs> <laughs> Balkans no debate. Everybody else can kill me as much as they want. The the Bosnians, especially the Muslim population, makes really good non pork meat and so on. And they make like the, their products made out of uh, minced meat, uh, especially the kebab and mm. so on with onions and blah 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 is absolutely top tier. So when it comes to minced meat i give it to my uh to my bosnian brothers but my serbian brothers when it comes to like just barbecue like fucking like like grilling that shit it's it's absolute top tier it's so top <laughs> tier that it, that it's weird no matter where you where you travel around the balkans or even like in western europe one usually thinks you know okay there's there's uh like uh, asian spots like you know for you know you have sushi mm. spots you have chinese uh restaurants and shit and then you have uh you know dinner place Places, uh, kebab places and so on but surprisingly there's a lot of it just says Serbian barbecue because it's like it's very simple uh, it's not really overthought there is a very specific uh, approach to how you how you grill it uh, and the, the thing that absolutely everybody pays attention to is obviously size and uh, just the quality of where you're getting the meat from and uh, Serbia being in that particular kind of position of still not being the European Union so not really being forced to export a lot of their high quality meats the way for example uh, Bulgarians are Slovenes are Croatians are and so on allows them to still put meat that's actually made in Serbia on the barbecue and then you know you actually receive a local product something that's been uh, unfortunately necessarily butchered uh, only a few days ago so it's all about the, all about the freshness and quite ironically the food is the meat is so good in Serbia because of a political reason <laughs> and, and that's them not being forced yeah. to export their local product mm. here in Brazil uh, cow meat is the top tier but uh, and cow meat in the south is very very cheap it's very accessible but that is not for a good reason <laughs> the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I was talking about the heat wave that we are going through in Brazil and uh, the, one of the reasons that we are experiencing such climate uh, extremities, it's because the deforestation, deforestation mm -hmm. to raise cattle. Yeah. So mm. the, the meat here in Brazil, the cow meat here in Brazil is cheap, but as I said, not for a good reason. We are yeah, destroying- At what we, cost, yeah. Yeah, at what cost, <laughs> uh, we. I, I don't like to talk about uh, we when we say, uh, when we talk about the climate change, the, when we talk about uh, the global yeah. warming, the capitalists, Brazilian capitalists, are destroying our biomes to raise cattle. So, mm. okay, we have very accessible meat. We export a lot of meat to China, especially. especially. But uh, the cost is way too high, and we, we are feeling the cost right now. Sorry to get all political all of a sudden, but... <laughs> <laughs> On this podcast, political? We never do this here. Oh, my God. Yeah. No, this no. podcast was Absolutely. much better before it got, it got political. Like Rage Against the Machine, it was much better <laughs> yeah, yeah. before it got political. <laughs> um, my God. Well, y'all said a whole bunch of places that ain't Texas, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and excuse myself. <laughs> We've got a whole we got a whole town dedicated to driving cattle to it and then <laughs> exporting the beef from there. Y'all ever been to Fort Worth? We still walk them cattle down the streets every Sunday. Um, <laughs> I will I will put 
I will put smoked brisket, Texas smoked brisket, toe to toe with yeah. any meat on earth. That's really <laughs> and good. I will, I will. That is my most nationalistic belief: is that uh, mm. Texas has perhaps the best meats in the world. If you say that with a Boomhauer accent, I'll believe you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a man of culture. Very good. Yeah. No, I was just gonna say when it comes to grilling, you know, in our parts. Like the tur, it's m much more of a Turkish thing, honestly. Uh, but it, I mean, the Arab world is so diverse. Uh, Did you just call me a Turk, Iraq, motherfucker? The, we. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Turk too. I'm a, uh, my family's Syrian, so uh, in Brazil, everyone hey. from the Middle East is called a Turk because of the <laughs> Ottoman Empire. So I'm a Turk too. Okay. <laughs> Hey, see exactly there right. Now, now JT is the only one who's who's disconnected, despite his weird hey. like, quasi Syrian ancestry somewhere up there. Yeah, I've, I've got um, some Syrian there. <laughs> okay, see, so they're, there you uh, go. we're all from the, the same Syrian, tribe. The, 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 what, what was that? I'm not yeah, white. Exactly. Please, I'm not what, white. What, what was that term? <laughs> that, that racist term that they did the, the the race science bullshit back in the day. Come on, remind me. There are a lot of them. The me skull yeah. measuring <laughs> bullshit. The fucking uh, oh phrenology. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Phrenology and breathing one <laughs> yeah. with another. So <laughs> I guess what explains us getting so well together uh, exactly. going, get, our skulls get, are all getting along the same so yeah. we, we, <laughs> it's gonna turn out that we're from this like same tribe somewhere in like uh, very east uh, Turkey yeah. like our great 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 like ancestors used to be like fucking neighbors if, and shit if we f uh, find the the phrenology uh, drawing like the the diagram the yeah. phrenology diagram for <laughs> Middle Eastern communists will find their head shapes all the same yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome back to the G program. Today we have a incredibly special guest, uh, a lovely episode prepped for you guys from the one and only Ian Nevis, can I say your full name? Am I allowed to? I'm mispronouncing it for sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, my, my full name is much bigger, but uh, for security reasons, it's Ian Nevis. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all right. Then I'll keep it at Ian Nevis for now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, um, he runs a fantastic uh, channel titled Historia Publica. It is a him and his work just in general on the channel and his other side work as well um, is dedicated towards a uh, Marxist historical approach and analysis to modern politics as well as historical topics. He makes excellently researched, essentially documentaries practically. They're fantastic fantastic videos if your portuguese is good enough to get some of them some of them have uh, subtitles which i'm very thankful for <laughs> but otherwise uh, the entire rest of his work is absolutely fantastic um but please ian introduce yourself let people know who you are what you do uh, hello, my name is Ian Neves. I'm from Brazil. I'm a Marxist historian. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very honored to be here. Hakim was a great inspiration for me. I've been watching your content, your, you guys' content uh, for a long time. Uh, we Brazilians uh, get a lot of inspiration from uh, English-speaking creators. So I, I think every Brazilian creator has a little bit of, of inspiration in in english speaking channels because usually things come with a little bit of a delay here in brazil mm. but uh, we had a great surprise because our marxist channels are growing really quickly Bra the brazilian public is showing interest in what we have to say and uh, uh just out of curiosity could you guys understand anything that i do because of the language there were a, a couple of videos with subtitles that the community did in, in English mm. to help uh, propagate our content. But uh, th did you guys just automatically translate to understand what I do? Yeah, yeah. no, there's um, something recent that's, I mean, recent. It's been, what, like at least four years old now. And it's gone pretty good is the automatic translator yeah. um, that uh, YouTube videos have. So mm -hmm. basically you get it to translate from the language that it automatically transcribes. So in this case it would be Portuguese into English. And you can get a, a very good chunk, maybe 90, 95%. Uh, comprehension of the videos um and that's how i that's the way that i've digested them sadly that <laughs> sadly, makes me very things. happy because uh we are communists and we are internationally so having mm -hmm. contact with uh, communists from around the world is very important for our movement and making my mm -hmm. content more accessible our content more accessible and i'll explain why i'm saying we all the time because i'm part of a um a collective a, an, an internet movement that I would like to show other people from around the world to maybe expand our practices 
So we can talk about this later, but I, I'm very honored to be here. And I, I will say something for my Brazilian audience. Uh, please don't harass uh, foreign <laughs> content creators, please. Uh, Brazilian people are very passionate about what they love, so sometimes they can be a little bit aggressive. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but it's it's from a place a place of love, a place of uh, passion. Brazilians are very passionate, and that's what makes uh, me love this country so much. I I disagree completely. Keep harassing them because that's how we get <laughs> to, uh, introduce each other to each other's work and slowly mm. uh, build out and grow this uh, this family of ours. I mean, uh, the 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 kind of the ground on which this show particularly has been built and kind of what differentiates us from arguably absolutely every at least audio show that's political and not even just political that's left-leaning and not just even left-leaning but political in general uh anywhere is because it is uh, truly international and that's why we put it as a yeah. goal for ourselves to use this platform that we were lucky enough to be given by our wonderful listeners to introduce mm -hmm. them also to many different uh, international and not just uh, from the English-speaking world, uh, both creators, agitators, activists, uh, and so on. So absolutely clicking, and uh, I guess uh, the uh, the brilliantly passionate uh, Brazilian people uh, uh, kind of uh, going out there and, and talking to a bunch of creators and yeah. connecting them through it is a, is a good thing. It's definitely a good thing. Yeah, and, and I love you guys. Uh, please uh, keep harassing the foreign creators. So that, that's there amazing. <laughs> Praxis. Uh, we, we do I love it. First debate on, on the program. And I win. We have a very... <laughs> <synthesized> it. It. <laughs> we are really proud of our community. We have a, a Discord server that has 50,000 people. Jesus wow. we have to add, it, It's the biggest, yeah, it's the biggest political uh, Discord server in Latin America. We uh, need a lot of work to make it work. A lot of... I uh, can't. Uh, <laughs> There's not enviable position. Yeah, whatsoever. it's crazy, <laughs> but it, it's really fun. It's really, it, we, we really built a community. Uh, I invite you guys to participate in the community because there, there is a lot of English-speaking people there. there uh, and the subtitles in English that you saw made manually were made by the uh, translating guild of our ser server mm. because mm. Uh, oh, nice. a professional translator that are communists met in our server and founded uh, a collective to translate revolutionary texts for Brazilian Portuguese to make it more accessible. That's just one example example of what we can do uh, by creating this space because you guys know how much of a, a far-right space the internet has become. Mm. Yeah. The yeah. internet has for become sure. a, a, a place where the far-right can thrive and, and debate and, and grow. And we did not have a space, a community, a forum, a Discord server that was big enough and a space for us to debate and meet and make friends and, and uh, study. And we are very proud. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of, uh, it gave us a lot of trouble. Uh, we are constantly vigilant about the server being shut down because yeah. it, it gets mm. attacked very often. But we are really, really proud. And we invite everyone listening to go to our server. We will, uh, we will leave the links uh, after the show and you can go there and uh, talk to us go to the internationalism thread and talk in, in speaking English and writing English and we can communicate to make this international movement grow mm. Fantastic. I, I would really like to build up on this point which is <clears throat> we're discussing socially beneficial collectives or socially ben beneficial spaces to you know improve uh, on a mutual basis uh, there is another one that was recently established a, a sort of uh, collective in, in, in Brazil that was established uh, along similar lines uh, that in the Western internet sphere were, were referred to as the Lulags. So can you please tell us what is the I left so hard when Lulag? I read when, you guys sent me the questions that I left so fucking hard when, you, when I saw Lulags because uh, we thought it was uh, it was a joke uh, for mm. the like Brazilian Marxist Leninists, but when, when I saw the Lulag, I was like, oh my God, this is so funny. Uh, so we can talk about what happened here to, to yeah. make the Lulags possible. So uh, we had uh, four years of pure hell with Bolsonaro. 
and then Lula won. Lula was our president uh, in the th 2000s. He elected his successor, which was Dilma. We can talk about her. She, she is very important. And then we had a coup against Dilma. Dilma got uh, impeached out of a coup. The vice president uh, took office, destroyed the rights of the workers. Until now, we are mm. fighting against it. Then Bolsonaro got elected, committed two genocides that we know mm. about. One genocide uh, from not buying the vaccines in, mm. in mm -hmm. able time. He delayed the vaccination of the population by a, a lot of time. With uh, conservative estimates, he must have killed 100,000 people mm. with the delay Jesus of the vaccine. Christ. And we have to talk about the other genocide that was committed during, during his, uh, his presidency, which was the Yanomami genocide in the north of Brazil. The Yanomami indigenous land got invaded by uh, illegal miners to mine the gold mines there. And the Yanomami died of treatable illnesses, hunger, violence, killing, murder, uh, executions. It was horrible. And as of all Latin America, the indigenous people are very forgotten and very brutalized. Mm. So we cannot mm. forget about the genocide that happened to the Yanomami people here in Brazil, uh, besides the genocide of, the, uh, of all Brazilians because of the pandemic. So uh, Lula won, mostly because uh, Bolsonaro was very incompetent. If Bolsonaro had just treated the pandemic with, with seriousness, a little bit of seriousness. It, it didn't need too much seriousness. He would have won. Lula won with a very tight margin, very tight margin. Uh, and then we had our very own capital. You know the invasion of the capital. I do, uh, uh, I do not know <laughs> how much of uh, international news that became, but uh, 8th of January this year, people invaded the the supreme court invaded the congress and destroyed the buildings with mm. uh, the help of the army the military and the police but brazil and bolsonaro imploded every chance they had for a coup lula had a lot of international support the us was supporting lula the us had said if someone tried a coup in brazil they would not support it which was it's the first time i've ever seen the us doing exactly exactly the reverse of what mm -hmm. about what they've been doing we can talk about the the original coup in 1964 here in brazil and the people that invaded the congress and, and the supreme court all got arrested we have like 500 uh prison uh, arrests and then that that's when the lulags came about <laughs> because there's there's one funny thing the capital was pretty funny come on it, it was funny oh, the, yeah. there was yeah. the the viking guy which was uh like with the 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 hammer, the Thor hammer yeah. in, in his chest and <laughs> mm. a guy stealing Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez shoes and, and, and uh, taking uh, <laughs> oh random objects. Sold it on eBay for sure. Yeah, the, yeah. The, it was funny. Okay, it was pretty funny. But Brazil, Brazil was like, uh, you don't know what funny means. <laughs> the first thing is, the hardcore Bolsonaro uh, supporters are of a very specific demographic. We have the neo-Nazis, Straight neo-Nazis, straight Latin neo-Nazis, uh, which is crazy to begin with. Super ironic. Uh, but Some of them, I'm very yeah, sorry, uh, we exported after World War II, like their grandpas and so on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the, the Latin neo-Nazis are, are crazy. Uh, but we have the uh, old people. Mm. The average age of the invader was 60 years old. Wow. <laughs> Why that, did that Boomer happen? Coup. It, Boomer yeah, coup. Yeah, <laughs> it was Boomer coup. It was crazy because uh, Bolsonaro... Telling you ages is the correct opinion. I'm sorry. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that, there is a very recurrent joke. Uh, the old people tried to execute a coup d'etat in Brazil. Hmm. And it, it was very old people. Old, old white people, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, why did that happen? In Brazil, Bolsonaro won especially because of his work and his campaign in the internet. And Brazilians, as I said before, are very present in the internet. Mm. The main way Brazilians connect to the internet is through cell phones, as all the third world, and through a messaging app called WhatsApp, which is from Meta. Mm -hmm. I do not know if this app is used uh, in yes, other countries yes. uh, besides Latin. the world all over yeah, yeah uh, every third world country <laughs> yeah but, but it isn't in the US right the US uses another app if I'm not if I'm not mistaken 
Uh, ask the resident yeah, American. <laughs> it depends. My <laughs> wife is from Zimbabwe, so she uses WhatsApp to talk to her family. Yeah, but sure. yeah, most Americans don't use WhatsApp, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah in Brazil, use WhatsApp Telegram is absolutely dominant. I, I, Telegram is very good, but I hear in America they only use it to uh, call their dealers and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, Telegram was uh, uh, parenthesis. The, Telegram was uh, was a big part of a investigation here in Brazil that ended in Lula's prison. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I, we can talk about this story uh, after. But uh, the the judge that arrested Lula, the, the convicted Lula, used a Telegram to talk with the lawyers. The judge can cannot mm. talk to the lawyer, but they were uh, like uh, talking about how would they arrest Lula no matter what. Mm -hmm. And they talked about this in Telegram, and the Telegram got leaked. The messages got leaked. Mm -hmm. So Oops. that was a big part of uh, Lula's, uh, why he got out of prison. Because of the yeah. leaked mm -hmm. Telegram messages, which were supposed to be more secure. As you said, people used to buy drugs. Telegram. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but WhatsApp, it's absolutely dominant here in Brazil. Uh, more than 160 million Brazilians use WhatsApp. Uh, which is half of the country, um, way more than the population economically active in Brazil. And why that is? Uh, Brazilians connect to the internet through cell phones. Brazilians buy cell phones and they have the mobile internet. Mm. With the mobile internet, the cell phone plans, I, I don't know how to say that in English, but the, the cell phone yeah, contracts yeah, yeah. mm. uh, mm. come with free WhatsApp. So it, it is not a mm -hmm. choice. It, it comes with the cell phone. You can use without spending your mobile internet a free WhatsApp. So mm. what, what did the Bolsonaro campaign did? They spread misinformation through this app, through this instant messaging app, similar to the Cambridge Analytica uh, uh, scheme with Facebook dur yeah. during mm -hmm. the Trump campaign. It was, it was very, very similar. And here in Brazil, uh, we can observe that when we were young, People used to say that the internet was a virus, a, a addiction in the youth, in the children, in the teenagers. <laughs> Today, yeah. I don't know how it is in other countries, but in Brazil, the internet is a problem with uh, uh, has an addiction. The internet has an addiction problem with the old people. Old people, yes. Yeah. It literally ruined my yeah, grandfather. Are, yes, yes. The old people are completely addicted to the internet and addicted to misinformation the internet. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that in the US, this is a big problem. A lot of people oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. got uh, into the alt-right, the fascist side, watching Fox News and, and talking uh, in closed groups in Facebook, just watching what they believe, uh, the QAnons and the 4chans and the, and, and the like. It, here in Brazil, this spread through WhatsApp. So as WhatsApp is, uh, has an addiction problem in the old age, mm. and uh, Bolsonaro made a very big campaign, very generously funded campaign in WhatsApp. The third age, as we say, now, the old people, are the real Bolsonaro no matter what. You know, the, the real hardcore yeah. Bolsonaro. So they uh, planned this coup, this crazy capital B Brazilian version of, of, the, <laughs> of a coup. And he had massive attendance of old age there. So the Lulags are populated with grandmas and grandfathers. And he's really weird, really weird. Because mm. not only they invaded the Congress, invaded the Supreme Court, they filmed everything and they posted in real time everything. Brilliant. <laughs> it, it is, it, there, is a, there, there is, there are many classic videos uh, that we can appreciate about what happened in 8th of January. Uh, there was one video where an old lady appears to be 67, 68 years old, is coming out of a toilet and saying, I shat all over the place. Fuck those guys, I shat all over the place. It is the, the Supreme Court toilet. And the, the guy filming says, oh, uh, Miss Fatima, God bless, God bless. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Miss Fatima, yeah, Miss Fatima shat all over the place, which I mean, shitting only on the toilet would be, would have been enough but all oh, right yeah. but <laughs> yeah. uh this woman th like this one guy, of my patients yes <laughs> sure miss fatima <laughs> so uh miss fatima uh, of course uh the video went viral and they went uh <laughs> to, people went to investigate who who the great miss fatima who shot all over the place, <laughs> place was. and they they discovered that miss fatima was a great crack dealer on her town 
<laughs> and wow. she, it, it, the, the story gets uh, better by the second. <laughs> She got arrested because not because she she shat she shat all over the place, but she because she was a crack dealer on her city, and, and uh, she dealt crack to the the middle class white uh, white uh, far right middle class of her her city, which I do not remember which one it was. But that's one of the videos. People stabbed uh, stabbed paintings. People broke uh, a two thousand and fifty year old clock there. Oh my uh, God. People filmed like, uh, look at this destruction. I made this destruction with their faces <laughs> uh, saying, oh, my name is, is João. My name is Jorge. I am from in saying their town, saying, saying their na the name of the families. And uh, <laughs> everyone got arrested. The name of the, the uh, unfortunately, the name of the prison is not Lulag. Uh, yeah, the, the female, yeah, the, the female prison uh, is called the uh, Beehive. I do, know, do not know why is it oh. called... Uh, the beehive, but uh, a recurring joke is: Is your grandma on the beehive? Yeah. <laughs> because a lot of people uh, said uh, uh, about uh, 500 people got arrested, but there was like 5,000 people there. Wow! So I know people who said my grandmother was in the coup. My grandmother filmed herself <laughs> uh, destroying the the Supreme Court, <laughs> destroying the Congress. Shit, they I know people who. <laughs> who <laughs> yeah. The, so the, there was, uh, but there there were neo Nazis there. Uh, mm. Definitely, the uh, uh, the neo Nazi movement in Brazil is growing very fast. During mm. the Bolsonaro years, we had a growth of like four hundred percent in neo Nazi cells, especially in the south of Brazil, which is where they concentrate. Because uh, Brazil, I don't know if you know this, but Brazil had the biggest Nazi party outside of Germany. Brazil, mm -hmm. of all yeah, countries, no. uh, Brazil had a very robust fascist movement called uh, Brazilian Integralism. Brazil had uh, a, a very long and complicated story, uh, history with fascism. And Bolsonaro kind of gave uh, permission for the neo-Nazis to come out of the sewers, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they concentrate, especially in the south of Brazil, because there are, there's a lot of uh, German immigration in the south of Brazil. Uh, a lot of neo-Nazis found refuge in Brazil, including Mengele. Joseph Mengele found refuge in Brazil. Uh, some neo-Nazis uh, got jobs during the uh, dictatorship, the military dictatorship with, that we had. Uh, we had Volkswagen here in Brazil, which was one of the biggest uh, car factories who uh, housed ex-Nazis, ex-Nazis. Uh, the current Nazi, Nazis, but uh, yeah. People who who fled fled Germany after World War II. So we have this this historical context for having so many neo-Nazi cells. But we know that what moves this fascist movements are not the hardcore cells. Is the the common worker who is eaten by the fascist rhetoric, which is what we are watching here in Argentina, right? Besides Brazil, after the yeah. tragedy that we lived, uh, Argentina is doing exactly what we did in 2018. And uh, uh, for as much as Brazilian and, and Argentinians have a bone to pick with each other, uh, we, are, we are very sad about what is happening with our hermanos, yeah. Uh, we are seeing a mirror of the suffering that we, we passed and Millet can be worse because Argentina is going through a much worse crisis, economic yeah. crisis, uh, unemployment crisis, violence crisis uh, than Brazil was. And Millet is also not constantly in the hospital. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro was always dying. <laughs> Bolsonaro yeah. looked like he was dying every week. And Bolsonaro, I don't know if you know this, but Bolsonaro got stabbed during the campaign. Yeah. yeah. So he but. was, uh, uh, there is a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God damn it. Uh, if the guy just twisted the knife. <laughs> in minecraft uh, we have of course. A, yes yeah. parody <laughs> we we have we have a, a joke here which is uh god damn that that is the worst stabbing i've ever seen <laughs> the worst stabbing i've ever seen uh we we saw bolsonaro like uh saying something or doing something reprehensible and the comments were also were always uh, worst stab i've ever seen <laughs> so bolsonaro got stabbed uh, it ruptured his intestines, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and he is he's he cannot shit. He the man <laughs> cannot shit for his life. So every month out he of was his in mouth. the hospital. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. He, 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 I, I'm not joking. He was taking shit out of his nose because oh, the, the man has cannot shit. And it was like, uh, I, I, I dream with Bolsonaro dying, exploding shit. <laughs> Imploding. I, uh, I don't know if that's possible. Hakim, correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, uh, sadly, <laughs> uh, it, said, it, it hasn't happened yet. Is what you're gonna say? It, it hasn't happened yet. It, it's, it's <laughs> like, if there's a will, there's a way. All right. If it, anyone can do it, it's him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because the, the, really, the guy looks like he's dying every month. Uh, yeah. You yeah. saw a, a, a couple of photos of him <laughs> kind right. of dying. Did, but didn't the KFC take him out in like Miami? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't I know. mean, a guy who can't he's fucking the, shit goes to America and has KFC of all fucking things. Not the best choice. Not the best oh choice. <laughs> That's attempted suicide. Yeah, that, uh, no, uh, that was, was the cry for help. That was literally attempted suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the the grotesque imagery, but uh, one time he was he was he cannot he could not shit because he didn't chew properly, which is like uh, <laughs> God damn. Because that's for the liberals. The guy is mediocre. Chewing is for the liberals. The guy is, yeah, <laughs> chewing is for liberals. Chewing is for communists. The guy is mediocre at everything. He cannot chew for his life. <laughs> <laughs> but we dream of him dying. We dream of him dying. Uh, and I, I, I'm not afraid to say that because uh, I, I told you guys that I, I run some risks because of yeah. my work here in Latin America. But uh, uh, wishing death upon Bolsonaro, if the government, <laughs> if the federal police is going after everyone that wished death upon Bolsonaro, they would not do anything else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Kill out the country. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm not afraid of that. Uh, but uh, what we were seeing, <laughs> we were yeah. stuck on the, on the <laughs> back, back on, on topic, back on track. So uh, we were talking about uh, the Lulaks. Uh, we have a federal police operation that we, that is looking for the people who funnel the money to make this coup attempt possible, because there was uh, food, there was uh, buses and buses coming from all over Brazil, the boomer buses. Uh, <laughs> carrying 60 year, year olds to shit all over the place the bathroom in the, <laughs> in the Supreme Court and uh, the, pol the federal police is investigating now who was financing all of this who paid for the shit <laughs> yeah who paid for all that who paid for the bombs planted in the Supreme yeah. Court but uh, the, the sad part is we know that the biggest responsible the biggest part responsible for this coup attempt is the military is the armed forces mm. yeah. and the mm. the military is completely um, shielded from every investigation from every scrutiny from everything this makes us very sad because brazil had a very rough um, past with the military with the military coup bolsonaro had a uh, past with the military coup he represents the basement the worst part the torture chambers of the military coup bolsonaro represented and brazil unlike argentina unlike chile did not have uh, what we call transitional justice which is trialing and arresting uh, the res the people responsible for the military coup and responsible for the torture for the exile for the murder for the persecution for the censorship brazil did not have a, a transitional justice so seeing the army the same army who did not have justice trying another coup and getting amnesty, getting away with it, makes us very sad and very disappointed at Lula's government. Mm. Very disappointed. Because uh, Dilma, his successor, we had two Lula governor, governments. Brazil has a law that uh, cannot permit, like the US, cannot uh, permit more than two re-elections, more than one re-election, actually. Mm -hmm. And his successor, Dilma, was a person that got tortured during the dictatorship. She was 19 years old. She got arrested. She got tortured. She got electrocuted. She, uh, she slept for days without water and food, naked in a ch cold chamber. And she did not snitch on anyone. Anyone. Wow. That woman is insane. She's extremely strong. And she tried to bring justice about uh, late, but tried. She, she, when she won the presidency, she started uh, organizing what we called uh, the National uh, Commission of Truth. The National mm -hmm. Commission of Truth was the commission that investigated the crimes of the dictatorship. That made the 
top brass of the military uh, started uh, opposing her government, and that was what made Bolsonaro famous, because Bolsonaro started defending the crimes of the dictatorship. So imagine the following: Dilma won. Dilma was tortured during the dictatorship. Dilma starts the National uh, Commission of Truth, the National Commission of, Commission of Truth. It starts investigation, it's investigating many of the uh, military members who were still alive or were sons or uh, grandsons of criminals. They start, get, they start getting angry at her, very angry at her, and they start opposing her government. Yeah. Meanwhile, one congressman who was there since the early 90s called Jair Bolsonaro, who was... Uh, a supporter of the crimes of the dictatorship, it starts openly supporting, openly supporting the criminals, surprise, and starts surprise. getting yeah, and and he starts getting uh, a bunch of support from the army, from the military. Mm. There was one episode who changed everything. The day Dilma got impeached, the voting for the impeachment was was live on television, and Bolsonaro which was uh, a congressman, was going to give his vote. And instead of just saying yes or no, he started by saying, I want to remember the legacy of Coronel Carlos Alberto Brilhante Ustra, the terror of Dilma Rousseff. He paid homage to Dilma's torturer mm -hmm. during her impeachment. If Brazil did not have this past of not have of having no transitional justice bolsonaro would have been arrested right there and then yeah, yeah. I, I, imagine the, the worst torture possible he went on national television in congress in federal Cong congress and paid homage to a torturer a convicted torturer who just did not pay for his crimes because he died of old age mm. so uh after that, Bolsonaro started getting very popular. He started getting, he started getting support from uh, the top brass, the top brass of the army. That is a lot of endo endogeny. I, I think that's the word. Endogeny in the army. So uh, the same families are the same families in the army since the 19th century, you know? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, uh, of course, the parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were the criminals. Mm. So they want these people want to protect their de, protect their last names. Yeah, and their they legacy. They do not yeah, want to. Yeah. yeah, their legacy, and they uh, uh, they are very. Uh, how can I say this? They are revisionists. In that they say it's it's a pattern that repeats itself in all Latin America. There is the widows of the the military coup, the widows of the dictatorship, that we call here in Brazil, that uh, say. The military regime saved Brazil from communism. The military regime saved Brazil from uh, economic crisis. The military regime brought about order, brought about discipline, brought love for the country, brought pa patriotism back. It was the best time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There are uh, middle class people who still think about this, about the military period like this. Positive, yeah. Uh, and Bolsonaro represented those people. Bolsonaro uh, was able to invoke this sentiment of uh, fake nostalgia of, of invented fabricated nostalgia for the military regime and it, it, if lula doesn't do anything to bring about justice right now after another coup attempt during his mandate during his presidency that had a big part played by the top brass then when we will have justice exactly. when we mm -hmm. when will we stop respecting the military demands the army is state bureaucracy the army obeys the army does not have to think the military has to obey civil orders not tell the government what to do yeah and follow their own particular interests as if they are a state inside of the yeah. state yeah 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 that we call the, the army a parallel party the yeah. we, we call it um uh, Party in uniform. Party wearing a military uniform. It's the mm. specific word in Portuguese. But uh, it's a parallel party. They uh, advocate uh, through their own interests and manipulate the Congress as they will. And they always threaten the government. Threaten them with law and order. Threaten them with weapons. And th yeah. This is crazy. And it's a pattern that repeats itself in all Latin America because of the... U.S. intervention after the, the Cold War started. 
but we, we can talk about this later. Yeah, not not to be, you know, always a downer, which I tend to be. But okay, so so they have political power. Uh, they have uh, political support from, as you said, mostly middle class liberals. And most importantly, they yeah. literally have, I mean, they are the army, they have their own army. So what is yeah. there really that like, no matter how much political will, there might be in in the country against them, and even if there was even greater political will that would push Lula to uh, get restorative justice against everything that they've done uh, in the past, pretty much uh, half century. Uh, even with that, would it really be possible? What could they do? I know I'm playing dev- devil's advocate here and so on, but uh, what is there for Lula to like uh, actually try and attempt? to do against such a powerful structure inside of Brazil itself? That is a great question. Uh, We we are demanding the immediate reestablishment of the National Commission of Truth. Immediate. The National Commission of Truth was studying what happened in the uh, military dictatorship, and it was trialing people who needed to be trialed. It was bringing about information. It was bringing justice to, to families who got their parents, their loved ones arrested, exiled, tortured, murdered. It was working. What uh, interrupted that was Dilma's impeachment. So it ah. is very mm-hmm. strange that the Lula does not want to mess with the army to that level. We are not demanding Lula to exonerate every single top brass general marshal. That, that is a communist dream, but that, that will come about when the revolution comes. But we are just asking for no amnesty, Lula to investigate the, the army officers responsible for the coup attempt in 8th of January this year, which is not too much to ask, is not yeah. too much to ask. We are asking because uh, Bolsonaro's government had more military officers than the military regime. He was able to make a civil government more military than the military regime. And a lot of the army officers were involved in the genocide of the Yanomami and the genocide of the people during the pandemic. A lot of generals. The uh, minister of health was a general and was an active general, wasn't even a reservist. Yeah. It, it's crazy. The guy didn't know anything about health. He was responsible for people in Amazonas, which is a state in Brazil. Uh, the Amazon is a forest. Amazonas is a state. It's one state. Uh, the Amazon covers a lot of states in Brazil. Uh, in Amazonas, we had a, a lack of oxygen crisis, and the people died without being able to breathe, and the government did, didn't do anything, even knowing that this oxygen, uh, that oxygen supply was very low. This guy is direct. This general, who was uh, the minister of health during that crisis, is directly responsible for this. Mm. That is the kind of justice we are asking for. And the only reason this guy do- does not get tried is because he is a general. Mm. It is because Lula does not want to mess with the army, as he did not mess with the army during his first mm. uh, first election in 2002. The first president who tried to bring, bring about justice was Dilma. And Dilma had to do that. Dilma got tortured. Dilma ha- has an amazing picture where she was, she was 19 years old. She is in a, uh, in a court and the judges behind her are covering his, their faces because they know they are in the wrong. They know mm-hmm. they are in the wrong side of history. And Dilma has her head really held up high. It's a historical picture that uh, really shows the strength of this woman mm. who supported the armed struggle against the military, against the uh, military regime, against the dictatorship, became president and tried to bring about justice. Uh, and just so you guys know how much of the military regime is embedded in our everyday experiences. I was raised in a very small neighborhood here in Sao Paulo. I'm from Sao Paulo. It's the biggest city in the country. Uh, it's not the capital. Uh, it's, uh, the capital is Brasilia in the middle of the country. Uh, Sao Paulo is the, uh, it's like New York. It's a very, very big city. Uh, it has 15 million people. And I was, uh, I was raised in a very small neighborhood of Sao Paulo. When I was a child, when I was, I was about uh, four or five years old, the mayor of the city discovered... Uh, during some investigations, a 
common grave. It was a mm. huge common grave with many, uh, how do you say people who, haven't, do, who do not have identity? Unidentified. Unidentified. Yeah, these yeah. disappeared people, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was, uh, it was worse than that because it was uh, after some examination. Uh, I don't remember how many bones they, they found, but it was, was in, in the thousands. And wow. uh, it was uh, like homeless people and homeless children that the uh, mm -hmm. military regime uh, would execute and throw in this, in this common grave. And that was, that was discovered in the 90s. As soon as the, they started investigating that, the army uh, started lobbying for the end of the investigations. Until today, that grave has not been fully investigated. That was just in my neighborhood, in my neighbor, my small neighborhood. We live with the dictatorship every day. We see the, the scars and the open wounds of the di dictatorship every day here in Brazil. So to see Lula back down and not do anything, even reestablish the National Com uh, Commission of Truth, really hurts. Really, mm -hmm. really makes us uh, look around, look at our neighbors yeah. in Argentina and Chile and Paraguay and see what they did. They tried, they brought about justice. They, uh, they arrested many of the perpetrators. In Argentina, we had an exemplary. Have you watched that movie, 1985, Argentina 1985, mm -hmm. who was the, the lawyer who was able to arrest the, the George Rafael Videla, who was the main, main president, main military president during the dictatorship. That did not happen in Brazil. This type of justice did not happen here. And it happened in Argentina. It happened to all our neighbors. But here, we did not have a, uh, a transitional justice. We have a peaceful transition who, that lasted like six or seven years with the military slowly giving away the power, uh, first by having indirect elections, but with civil uh, participants, then direct elections, uh, but very slowly, very controlled. Uh, so sorry to, <laughs> to make everything so sad, but uh, Latin America history is, is, is like that. I, I would say, because um, you, you covered what would have been my second question, which is the, the fact that Lula is a soft social democrat, um, and he was imprisoned mostly as a result of his, or despite uh, his, uh, you know, uh, gloves, handling with, with, with kids' gloves attitude towards the military, towards the far right, and towards other, uh, towards the property classes uh, within Brazil. Um, and of course, the, the, my question would have been if there's been major tangible improvements in his politics post imprisonment, but you kind of, kind of covered the, the changes that are occurring in Brazil, and there, on some cases they are, in some cases they aren't. I think a more relevant question, I think, at this point is, the history of Brazil has given us a tremendous wealth of leftist tradition. Yeah. Um, of course, historically very fractured and, and divided, but comparing now with, for example, the 90s, let's say, the eight, end of the 80s and the 90s, there seems to be a resurgence or a new development of the Brazilian left. Could you kind of walk us through that tell us how, how you experienced it with you, what's been going on yeah sure uh, brazil had a very intense class struggle and brazilian had, had a very uh, active communist party but what changed everything was the military coup so uh, brazil founded its uh, communist party in 1922 as a part of the third international the party was very active uh, during the 30s, we had our, our first, uh, in the 20th century, our first dictatorship, which was Vargas dictatorship. The Communist Party got illegalized. Some uh, members got killed. Some got arrested. Some went in exile. Uh, one of the most famous, I don't know how famous he is outside of Brazil, but it is Luis Carlos Prestes. Mm. Luis Carlos Prestes is one of the most important Brazilian communists that ever lived. And he is uh, really... To understand Brazilian communism, we have to understand Prestes. Uh, uh, during the 40s, after the, the end of the World War II, the participation of Brazil at the side of the Allies and the growth of socialism all around the world, the Communist Party got really big. The most voted for senator was Prestes, was a communist, open communist, part of the former Third International, was, a, as we would be called today, a Stalinist. Oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> uh, and he got uh, uh, elected as uh, the most voted for senator in the, in the whole country. So uh, immediately in the 40s, co the Communist Party got uh, illegalized again. 
because it, it, it went back to being a threat. And we know that every time communists start being a threat, they are mm -hmm. illegalized. They are mm -hmm. put in the clandestine uh, roles. The movement grew from the 40s to the 60s, but then the U.S. lost Cuba. When the U.S. lost Cuba, they started a massive operation in Latin America to keep every single politician that slightly leaned left for getting into power. Mm -hmm. So when the coup happens in Brazil, we already had a coup in Guatemala. We had a very famous coup in uh, the Dominican Republic. We had a coup in Ecuador. And then we had a coup in Brazil that came about a little bit late because uh, there was a coup attempt uh, early on and it wasn't very successful because the left in Brazil was very organized, very organized. So what happened was the U.S. lost Cuba in 1959. After the U.S. lost Cuba, it started being afraid, it started uh, observing the threat of the USSR expanding its influence through Latin America. So what did they do in Brazil, for example? They started to fund and stimulate think tanks in all of Latin America. Here in Brazil, they founded two think tanks, one called IBAD, other called IPES. The IBAD was responsible for cleaning up the military. What were they doing? It was a think tank that studied the military and expelled every single, uh, what they call, watermelon. Watermelon is a army officer who is green on the outside and red on the inside. <laughs> <laughs> that is the watermelons. So the Ibad in 1959 started cleaning up the army. The Ipes in 1960, I believe, uh, 1961, I believe, uh, it started creating short films, books, pamphlets, journals, magazines with the weirdest, most crazy anti-communist propaganda you have ever seen. So mm. they started publishing Orwell, Hannah Arendt, uh, they started publishing this anti-communist, uh, the, the intelligentsia, you know, the mm -hmm. anti-communist intelligentsia. Everyone in Brazil has a, a copy of the, the Animal Farm from the 60s that was mm -hmm. published by the uh, US-backed think tank, which was a way to uh, embed anti-communist in the heart of the Brazilian people. So what they started doing was preparing psychologically and mentally for a coup. The other side was there were elections in Brazil and Brazil had a system where you could vote for the president and the vice president separately, which is uh, something that uh, obviously is going to go wrong, but it was like that uh, back then. So the guy that won the presidency was a very far right, very Bolsonaro, Trump, uh, Le Pen, Georgia Meloni like. It was very weird guy, uh, a far right guy, very conservative, uh, very strange looking. Uh, he talked in perfect Portuguese like someone talking. It, it, is, it is as if he spoke in archaic English, you know? Mm -hmm. It was very, yeah. uh, very strange. He was a very strange figure. But his vi the vice president was a very left leaning guy. Was a, uh, th there is a movement here in Brazil who we call the labor, the labor movement. And uh, it, it, they weren't communists, they weren't socialists, but they were the labor movement. It's like the, the specific, thi specific thing of the Brazilian historical uh, class struggle. Mm. And then uh, the, this guy, with, which was from the left side of the labor movement, won the vice presidency. What happened was the, the crazy guy, the far right guy, how do you say? He left office. He all of a sudden resigned in a crazy coup attempt. And then the left-leaning guy took office. That was the first time the, uh, the U.S. tried to start a coup in Brazil. The left-leaning guy, the labor movement guy, was in China, Mao's China at the time. What they tried to do in 1961 is to keep him from coming back. Hmm. So for uh, I don't know how many days, how many months, he got stuck in China. He could not come back for Brazil to, to, to take office. When he came back to Brazil, very fast the parliament voted for a regime change and Brazil became a parliamentary system to keep this guy from getting into office. So there, there was a, 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 this movement because the US saw this guy as a start of a left-leaning movement who could become a mass movement who could get into the USSR zone and et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this guy... 
the the left started a campaign that we call the legal legal legalization campaign. Legalizing. Legal. Uh, it, it sounds like marijuana when you say it like that, but. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But it was the, the legal, to legalize his office, to legalize yeah. his, his taking of office. Uh, he took office and he started a, a mild change in the land policy of Brazil because Brazil is a very agrarian export, exporting country. So uh, the land reform in Brazil was his priority. That was the tipping point. The land reform was the tipping point. When this started, the U.S. had already spread McCarthyism through all of Brazil, they uh, traveled to every single state, going to schools, going to unions, going to uh, collectives, going to workers associations, showing short movies, showing uh, distributing uh, free pamphlets, giving books with, uh, with anti-communist rhetoric. And a thing that is very common, pre-coup, saying that Brazil was astray, Brazil was in chaos, in shambles, it needed fixing, and who was there to save Brazil? The army. So yeah, The trains the run on time, etc., etc., the classics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the trains running on time, etc. The, the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. chose a general to become president. We, we, we know this because we have the CIA declassified documents. And the CIA has this habit of declassifying documents and saying, yeah, I did that. I did that shit. Mm, yeah. What are you going to do about <laughs> it? I did all of it. Yeah. <laughs> what we know about the coup... But we, but we promise... Yeah, we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> uh, uh, we, well, everything we know about the coup comes from the CIA declassified uh, documents because Brazil did not have uh, transitional justice and we cannot access the documents here. The army does not let us access our own documents. We only... We, we know the history of the military regime through oral history to a few documents here in Brazil and, and through a many documents that the CIA declassified. So we know that the CIA had chosen the general that would become president years before. They wanted to choose the general that was most aligned with U.S. interests. When the coup happened, the president got de deposed and th that guy, th this general, took office And then in 1964, the military dictatorship starts and it ends in 1985. During that, what, what does that have to do with the left? During that period, the left split. Uh, Hakim told us about the, the fracture of the Brazilian left. The first fracture comes in 1961, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, with the Great Debate part of the, the communist movement. Between the USSR and China. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. exactly. Part of the movement uh, stayed with the USSR. Part of the movement split and stayed with China. And uh, a little bit with Albania too. The part they stayed with, the USSR, did not adopt a guerrilla movement, a guerrilla tactic. Mm. They did not go for armored struggle. The part that they stayed with China and Albania went for armored struggle. So we have uh, these two parties are called the, Com the Brazilian Communist Party and the other is Communist Party of Brazil. And yep. it, they are very <laughs> always similar. Always so original. They exist always. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, they exist until today, but they split on that time. And during the dictatorship, the big debate was to go for armed struggle or to not go for armed struggle. Uh, as we know, to not go for armed struggle was a very Khrushchev thing to do. Yeah. To be mm. pa a pacifist and to... Cringe. Uh, yeah. Very yeah. cringe thing to Very, do. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I personally think it was a mistake. The Communist Party, the Brazilian Communist Party, thinks it was the right thing to do. I personally do not think it was the right thing to do. The other party, which was the, uh, quote, Maoist, end quote, which was another thing back then. It wasn't the, the go go yeah. Presidente Gonzalo Maoist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, not that kind of Maoist. Uh, not the baby cuisine mouse. Yeah, not not that. It was the yeah. the uh, uh, today they call it, they call it uh, Mao Zedong thought so, yeah. something mm -hmm. like that. Exactly. Uh, they went for a much more aggressive policy to liberate the country, and during that time, the military regime was very effective in dismantling unions, persecuting uh, union leaders, illegalizing parties arresting and putting into exile many leaders of many parties, torturing many guerrilla members, torturing people who had nothing to do with anything. And Brazil 
did not recover well in the 90s mm. because we were coming from a military dictatorship that murdered, that persecuted, that destroyed the organized left in many ways. The labor movement, the union movement, the, the communist movement, the socialist movement. And we enter in the 90s with the end of the USSR and the rise of neoliberalism in Brazil. So the communist movement was on the defensive and we stayed on the defensive for about 20 to 25 years. We start to see a resurgence on the communist movement after Dilma's coup and Bolsonaro's government. We went on an unprecedented economic crisis. Unemployment went sky high here in Brazil. The police violence, police brutality is insane lately. And then the communist movement started to rise again. So currently, we have a, a resurgence of the communist movement, but the a communist movement that is not connected to the historical movement. So remember the split that I, that I said uh, with the Brazilian Communist Party and the Communist Party of Brazil? Neither of those movements are being very successful in, in the resurgence of the, commun of the communist movement in Brazil. We have a new communist movement. We have uh, recently a newly founded Marxist party, which is inspired by the Black Panther Party, nice. uh, which is very inspired by uh, Enver Hodges' thought, inspired by uh, the USSR pre-Khrushchev. So it's, it's a very strong movement. I'm putting a lot of faith in it. Uh, we work a, a lot with it, which is called the Popular Unity, UP, which is the same name of the party that won the election in Chile. It, it is inspired mm -hmm. in, in Allende's Chile. So mm. the popular movement was founded like in 2019, if I'm not mistaken. And it is a very grassroots, close to the working people with a ton of uh, different movements that work for uh, women who suffer violence, who people, people who do not have where to live. Uh, the union movement is very strong. And uh, we needed this resurgence. We needed this, this communist movement that went outside the universities. Because for, for 25 years, the communist movement was in the defensive, was just protecting itself from ex extinction, and it was exclusive to debates in the universities, which didn't reach the, the population. Brazilian population does not have access to universities yet. So now we are seeing a resurgence of the communist movement getting outside the academia outside the universities and going back on the streets. This makes me very happy. And we are seeing also a big resurgence of the communist movement in the internet, which is something that I, I'm proud to, proud to be a part of. And uh, as I said, very inspired by the work of, uh, of you guys and the work of, I have to say, Luna Oi and Lady Zihar too. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. to, to give props to, to other comrades that mm. do ex spectacular work and inspired us very much to start what we were, we are doing right now. I, I don't know if I gave too many historic too much historical context to this situation, but uh, I I am a historian historian that is my strong side. So uh, we can talk about if you if you talk about the left, we have to talk about also uh, about Lula's party, which is mm. the Workers Party. PT, Workers' Party. As I said, during the military regime, the communist left, the, the communist movement got fractured, got persecuted. Uh, the labor movement got persecuted, got really dismantled. But what happened was the military regime had a strong policy of lowering wages with, uh, with not adjusting wages to the inflation. So they, uh, I do not know how to say this in English, but they did not adjust the, the minimum wage to inflation to make the wages shorter. So uh, yes. mm. after f like 15 or 16 years of shortening wages, this gave rise to one of the biggest strikes in Brazil's histories, which was a strike here in the big part of Sao Paulo, which Lula was a great leader. Lula was a great union leader, the, maybe the biggest union leader we've ever had. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, 250,000 workers went on strike under the leadership of Lula. Workers that worked on uh, car manufacturers. After, the, after 1979, we start a period of the military regime called the amnesty. What was the amnesty? The amnesty was 
a law that made possible for strikes, for uh, unions, for parties, for exiles to come back, made all that legal in exchange of not, not prosecuting any criminals that were part of the torture, the murder, the killing, the exiles. So it was more of an amnesty to themselves. The army gave an amnesty to themselves. It was like, oh, you can come back to Brazil, but uh, don't expect me to be judged for my crimes. After the uh, law of amnesty, the, the union started forming again, the strikes started happening again, and that, that is when this, strike, this massive strike happens, and it happens in 1979, 1980, and 1981. During that time, a big coalition of uh, left-leaning social democrats forms that would be the, the seat of what would become the working party, the workers' party, the mm -hmm. PT, as we call it. So it had a big participation of the uh, left-leaning Catholic Church, which is uh, something very important in Latin America as a whole. It had a very important role of many ex Trotskyites and that ex uh, slightly communist socialists uh, who got together to found this new party and he was very connected to the union movement and uh, um, especially the union movement in the big cities. So the Workers Party uh, becomes the biggest party of the country, left-leaning, and the biggest mass movement that Brazil has ever seen. So uh, for about 10 years, they grew. They really worked with really working people, the proletariat. But, but as Prestes would say, remember when I said Luis Carlos Prestes is one of the most important communists of Brazil? Mm -hmm. Prestes already said during that time, the Workers' Party does not, does not have a proper ideology. They do not have, a, have ideology. It is a mass movement. It is a mass movement rooted in the working class, but it does not have ideology. He was absolutely right. Absolutely right. What happened was, in 1989, we have the first direct election for the presidency since the coup. One of the candidates is Lula. Lula is very popular. And the Brazilian bourgeois made everything to keep him from winning. Everything. And during that time, the USSR still existed. Lula still talked about socialism. He talked about uh, owning the means of production. He, he had a slightly radical rhetoric during that time. He almost won, almost won. Mm. The bourgeois candidate won. I have a documentary about him in my channel. Uh, in the same series of Pinochet, uh, which is called Why We Hate, I have the Why We Hate uh, series. The first one is Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the second one is that president, which is called Fernando Collor. Fernando Collor was the very first uh, directly elected president of Brazil since the coup. And he was a raging neoliberal, raging neoliberal. Mm. So uh, the neoliberal uh, candidate wins. Lula tries again, loses, tries again, loses again. He loses three times. And then Lula starts changing his discourse, changing his tactic. So he starts working with the financial market, he starts working with the bourgeoisie, he starts working with landowners, he starts working with the army. So that causes his election in 2002. If you compare Lula's uh, speech, Lula's discourses, Lula's talking points in the Workers' Party program in 1989 with 2002, it does not look like the same party. It's crazy. Yeah. He really had to give away to win the election. So that is what uh, we lived through eight years of Lula and uh, I don't remember how many years of Dilma. It was a coalition government. It was a, how, how do we say that? Uh, it was a, yeah, class collaboration is fine. Uh, Lula tried to make a government that pleased everybody. So the banks profited historically during his government. Many landowners and business owners said, if I knew Lula's government would be like this, I would have voted for him. Jesus we heard that. Christ. <laughs> yeah, that, that is crazy. But, 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 and it's a big but. We had a historical poverty relief during Lula's yeah. government. That, that is true. And everything that relieves the suffering of the working class, I'm in favor. Not Even cool. if it's uh, just immediate. That's why we, we, 
as communists campaign for Lula right now because the working class needs to eat right now. It doesn't need to eat tomorrow. Yeah. And Lula was a very poor person, very poor person. And he experienced hunger himself. Lula didn't go to school. He didn't study. That was a major talking point during his first candidacy is that he was illiterate. He was dumb. He wasn't prepared. Uh, and that is not the truth. That is not the truth. He just didn't go to the traditional way of preparing. But Lula is a very intelligent guy. He's a very outspoken person. He's really smart. During his presidency, he said, my main goal is to get Brazil out of the map of hunger. And he did. He did. He did get Brazil out of the map of hunger, which is uh, worth of mention. Mm -hmm. But uh, we as communists, we as Marxists know that as long as the means of production are not controlled by the working class, the bourgeoisie will always have the upper hand. What made possible the advances of the Lula government, the mass economic rise that Brazil experienced during the 2000s? The Brazilian economy was expanding, was growing. So that gave a margin for Lula to make uh, some concessions to the working class. When the recession came, because it always comes, it, it, uh, we, we are in the periphery of capitalism. When the recession came uh, in about 2014, 15, what happened? Dilma got impeached. We have uh, a neoliberal government that worked day and night to be blunt, to create uh, un uh, intentional unemployment in Brazil. During Dilma's presidency, Unemployment in Brazil reached 2%. 2% is a historical mark in Brazil. We had never experienced such low unemployment. But as we know, low unemployment means higher wages. When the crisis came, the main goal of the new government, the new neoliberal government, was to reduce the rights of the workers, make working less, uh, uh, as we call here, we have registered workers and autonomous worker. The main goal was to make uh, uh, less of the working class registered workers because the, not, the unregistered workers can be exploited more. Mm -hmm. So the, this crisis created massive unemployment and the project of the bourgeoisie, the project that came after the impeachment of Dilma was very successful, very successful. So... Uh, what are we expecting for the future? Lula is repeating the same formula. What is the Lula formula? Lula is the president. He can appoint uh, ministers as he wishes. What does he do? Always, always, always. The, the Congress is conservative. The Congress in Brazil has never been progressive. The Congress has always had the majority of right-wing parties. Always. How do you govern when you are left-leaning president with a right-wing Congress, making concessions. What are the concessions that Lula makes? He gives ministries to the right-wing parties. Yeah. So we have Lula from the Workers' Party who has many ministers who are from parties that we can very safely call fascist. Mm -hmm. This is the formula for disaster. It already, it, it already happened before. It will happen again. So what we communists are saying is that what we are doing right now in the third Lula government is repeating the same thing, expecting different, different results. The definition of insanity, yeah. So uh, what we are doing as uh, communists, as uh, left-leaning militants, we are preparing for the next election. We are seeing a little bit of a mirror uh, of what can happen in Brazil. In the US right now, Trump is coming very strong. The Biden government was not sufficient. The working class is not pleased. The crisis continues and Trump might win again. Here in Brazil, we do not expect Bolsonaro to win again, but we expect a strong fascist figure to come back in the next election. So we have to be prepared as a mass movement that identifies itself with something that is not the Workers' Party. Because yeah. the mass movement in Brazil is still very connected to the Workers' Party because of their, their historical uh, work with the working class. Their historical work of the unions, the landless movement, which I don't know if you know, but Brazil has one of the biggest landless movements of the whole world, with this, which is MST. It's a fantastic 
fantastic movement. It's admired in the whole world and it's uh, something that we are very proud of. The, uh, the landless movement is, is something that is very connected to the Workers' Party and it gave a lot of support to the Workers' Party, but it's starting to get a little bit impatient because have you ever seen a map of Brazil? Is it, yeah. <laughs> is it reasonable to have a landless movement in this country? Mm. The problem of Absolutely. Brazil is a historical problem. It's a problem of big landowners that has not been solved with a government that the landless movement helped elect. So I, I, I'm sorry, there are many things to talk about in Brazil. I have been doing this for three years every week. So <laughs> I keep opening doors and not closing them. No, so uh, perfectly fine, yeah. uh, In a very related, semi-related at the very least, development, we can say, in Latin America is the result of the recent Argentinian election uh, where earlier you were mentioning grandma shitting, and now we move on to <laughs> cosplaying presidents. Um, so it seems like Latin America is really going down the drain, <laughs> both figuratively and uh, no, I'm, I'm teasing. But uh, this ridiculous figure that has recently won the, in these elections, the redditor uh, president, exactly right. It is first uh, lady. Sister. I wouldn't be surprised if he. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> Fucking hell. Oh my! I God. wouldn't be surprised if there are like forum posts of of him on like anima forums talking about oh no it's not a nine-year-old girl it's a, it, <laughs> it's a six thousand year old <laughs> dragon yeah. i do not I be want to know if he has a discord account i really do not yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to know what he's been sending to to the miners on his discord uh, <laughs> yeah. anyways but but is this just the argentinian people looking for alternatives were these right libertarians just filling the current gap is it something else what do you think is, is happening exactly there oh uh, we brazilians have been observing this guy for years because um uh, we uh, just so first things first what this guy is representing is something very contemporary uh which is becoming famous no matter what makes you win elections <laughs> and i'll i'll be honest with you guys i did not remember his name but i remember his hair when yeah. i saw him for the first <laughs> time about about four or five years ago i did not remember his name but but i remember his figure and I yeah. know this is intentional. I know this is intentional. Uh, Boris Johnson does it intentionally. Trump does it intentionally. Bolsonaro does it intentionally. Uh, and as we can see, this is a movement around the world. The neo-fascist liberals, neo-fascist neoliberals mm -hmm. uh, are coming to presidencies or uh, to first ministries. And as we Marxists always say, this has a lot to do with the unprecedented crisis that capitalism is going through right now. Mm. So uh, in the case of Argentina, we have a very close relation to Argentina. Brazil is the biggest uh, trade partner of Argentina, which is great because uh, Javier Milei already said that he will not be trading with communists. Uh, mm. This is a thing. Uh, this is a situation where we say, I wish you were right. I wish Lula was a communist. I really wish. Mm. I wish the right was the right was right in this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, but what can we observe in Argentina? Argentina seems to be in permanent crisis since the '90s. It went through the same process that uh, all of Latin America went. Uh, aside from Chile, Chile was a, a bit different because of Pinochet, uh, which was neoliberal governments changing their economic policy. So in Argentina, we had De La Rua, and we had uh, Man Carlos Menem. Two presidents that were very neoliberal and that uh, tried one economic policy of making the peso, the, the Argentinian currency, paired with the dollar, the US dollar. So we have a historical precedent to what Millet is doing, which he claims to be able to close the central bank, stop emitting currency and using US dollars as an Argentinian currency. This has a precedent. I believe it happened in the first time during, during De, La Rua, De La Rua's government. Argentina went to, through a very, very similar process as Brazil in the context of, of what we call the pink wave. The pink wave was a wave of social democratic elected governments in Latin America. So the very first one we have was Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Hugo Chavez won the election in 1998. Then Lula won in 2002. We had Nestor Kirchner. In Argentina, we had Evo Morales in Bolivia. Uh, so we call this pink wave. Why pink? Because it wasn't a red wave. It wasn't a communist wave. It was a social democratic wave. So it was pink. It wasn't very red. We had this wave of progressive governments. And then we had, at the same time, 
more or less in every Latin American country an unprecedented crisis. So when the crisis came, the fascists came out of the sewers and said the crisis is happening because of the social democratic governments, not because of the uh, cyclical crisis that capitalism capitalism goes goes through every time. Uh, what happens is the following: unemployment rises, the cost of living rises, the working class suffers. It is the first to suffer in every capitalist crisis because we pay the bill. The bourgeoisie does not pay the bill. The working class pays, and This is very important. Where the working class suffers, it radicalizes. The working class mm. goes through social democratic governments, right-wing conservative liberal governments, and it doesn't see change. And it's, it sees its quality of living lowering. So it radicalizes. It wants change. The working class wants change. If the radical left, if the communist movement is not organized enough, it will turn to fascism it will is the logical answer that's yeah. what the youth in argentina is saying the youth in argentina which massively voted for milay is saying you are crazy for not voting for milay you are crazy for not voting for him because if you vote for maso burhich which were the the other uh, candidates you are voting for us to keep as we are And we yeah. are suffering, suffering. We are unemployed. Yeah. We cannot pay rent. We cannot afford food. So when the working class radicalizes, the bourgeoisie organizes, its, organizes itself to absorb this radicalization. And it absorbs its radicalization through these fucking crazy figures that we are seeing around the world. This is a new thing. Fascism. The historical fascism during the 1910s, 20s, uh, 30s uh, already had this rhetoric of making capitalism seem revolutionary. So it, it had a roughly capitalist rhetoric with uh, private property strengthened, uh, with the corporativist view of society. It, so the, the, the rhetoric is uh, roughly the same. It is capitalism. It's actually revolutionary. Our version of it is revolutionary. We see, uh, as Marx says, that the, uh, how, how do I say that in English? The first is a tragedy, now is the farce. Yes. Mm. That we are seeing the farce version of this, of this yeah. which is, what is anarcho-capitalism if not a movement? An internet meme, yeah. That says, turned into a movement. Yeah, yeah uh, b besides a meme, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a meme, it's an ideology, which says, capitalism never happened. And when it happens... It will yeah. be revolutionary. Can you see how this is an extreme version of classical fascism, which already claimed that the real capitalism will be revolutionary? So Millet is the extreme version of it. And the only reason Bolsonaro is not an anarcho-capitalist is because he does not know what that is. And please, <laughs> please, can nobody tell him? Please. <laughs> Don't tell him what that is. Please, please. But uh, it's roughly the same. When Bolsonaro uh, got elected, one thing that he said over and over again is that during his government, he wants to make Brazil really capitalist. What does that mean, really capitalist? Brazil is already capitalist. Mm. But what he says with really capitalist is that we are not true capitalists and the real mm -hmm. capitalism is revolutionary. So the youth who radicalizes first because it's the first to feel The, the crisis, the unemployment crisis, uh, at least, is the very first to be dragged, be pulled into this rhetoric, which pseudo-revolutionary. Where do we go from here? We, as a revolutionary left, we, as a radical left, need to be organized in this moment. Because when crisis comes, the working class will turn to the most apparently radical movement. That's what happened in Argentina. Absolutely. People suffered, people radicalized, and people looked at this crazy guy who at least is not more of the same, apparently, apparently. Mm. But uh, we are seeing, uh, to be honest, we're seeing <laughs> every, every time we're seeing uh, crazier and crazier and crazier figures. And I do not know where do we grow from here because this guy is something <laughs> else. 
Hopefully mm. he's the peak, you know. you know, asking your dog uh, yeah. for their political opinion <laughs> is hopefully the highest stage of uh, reactionary <laughs> insanity mm. that we that we had. And the, the, the way he got famous is very similar to Bolsonaro because uh, Millet is an economist, according to himself, he's an economist. And uh, he went a lot on reality shows and talk shows and uh, whatnot. And uh, he was invited to the shows in television. The Zelensky way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, there's a, yeah, the Zelensky way. We were comparing him to Zelensky. Uh, Bolsonaro did this uh, also. He also went to these uh, talk shows and reality shows and whatnot because he uh, talked a lot of shit and gave a lot of audience. So mm. the, the, it was the, the, the clown that was doing his clown thing. But what uh, accidentally happened is that he became famous. He became mm. very famous. Millet uh, did the same thing. Millet has a, 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 a talk show that he's being part of where he's talking about having lots of sex, being the CEO of sex, being the, the sex god. <laughs> and the, and it, it's very weird and, and it's very... Mm. Uh, uh, so the, the crazy part makes him, him memorable. And we, yeah. the, the, the people cannot not talk about this guy, even if it's bad. Yeah. But yeah. The, the sad part is... Uh, what makes him very similar to Bolsonaro is people are not looking at his vice president. His vice president is the daughter of a military general who is a revisionist of the military period in Argentina, which is crazy because Argentina, differently from Brazil, went through a transitional justice. Argentina arrested, trialed and arrested, gave life sentences to the perpetrators of the military uh, regime so to have elected at this point a vice president who wants to make uh, remember when i said the national commission of truth she wants to make the uh, uh, kind of a national commission of uh, lies to trial the guerrilla movement to trial the communist movement to trial the the workers movement to fought who fought against the dictatorship she wants to d d do it upside down you know yeah yeah uh, and that is very similar to Bolsonaro. That's why Bolsonaro clicks so much with this guy. Both are revisionists from the military period. Both believe that the military period was the best period for the country. And both are putting in the government figures from the neoliberal movement of the 90s. Remember when I said uh, uh, that Argentina went through two neoliberal governments in the 90s, the De La Rua and the Carlos Menning. Mm -hmm. uh, Millet has... Uh, Millet has secretaries and ministers from that period, from the same period of the neoliberal movement, aside from the dollarization of the economy, which already happened during the De La Rue's government. So uh, it's very, uh, to, to summarize everything, it's sad, but it's very predictable, very predictable, mm -hmm. predictable. As soon as I saw this guy, I said in my videos, this guy's going to win. There's no chance he's going to lose. And he won and he, he won with a very large margin. I don't know if you saw. And even... 56%, uh, percent, right? Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. It's, uh, it, this, uh, this is crazy. This is very crazy. And uh, he, he got completely destroyed during the debates. But people mm. nowadays do not watch the debates. People oh, fuck, come yeah. in contact. People, people uh, see the news on their cell phones. Yeah. People use uh, what, what I was saying in the beginning, WhatsApp. People use Facebook, people use Twitter, people use Instagram or, or whatever. Uh, the television is not as strong as it used to be. So controlling that television is not enough anymore. Oh man, what a what a beautiful and action-packed episode. Genuinely, <laughs> yeah. I think I think all of us totally didn't uh, wouldn't have gone out more than hundred words. This was that was fascinating. We're gonna ha we're gonna have to get you back on. I'm so yeah, sorry for speaking too, too much. Two, no, two. it's very you know, good. You didn't speak too much. You didn't speak enough, and it's a shame we have to. <laughs> but look, um, I think the 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 greatest development that we've learned here is that the come to Brazil come to Brazil meme is generally one, of, one <laughs> is the best meme to exist. Uh, if it didn't, then uh, most likely this wouldn't have happened. Uh, so I'm very thankful to your audience for uh, honestly terrorizing us uh, <laughs> with 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 uh, with requests for you. But uh, this was beautiful. You covered everything from the leftist, uh, both historical 
perspective within Brazil as, as well as what's currently going on politically within Brazil. The the uh, meme that was uh, the uh, occupation of various uh, yeah, I, buildings. I have to uh, send you guys the videos, even if you don't understand please, Portuguese. Yeah. The images are really, yeah. really funny. Please, so. please do. Yeah, you covered the the events in Argentina very well. Uh, even the history of the of the of the uh, dictatorships, which we would very much like to get you on specifically for a mm -hmm. dedicated part two. Um, I didn't even get through half my questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so the, that, the, that the shows dictatorship is something that we keep studying every day because it, it is very uh, embedded in exactly. our culture. You live with it. Yeah, we live Up with until it until today, so, uh, and we have to talk about it because we we lived through a government that uh, said that the, the everything that we you learned. He he, he used to say this. Everything that you learned about that military regime is, was false. That that uh, made the historians mm. uh, historians work very hard. So every time you want to talk about anything Latin America involved, you can call. Oh, I didn't have time to talk about my my collective, but. But it's, <laughs> it's, all right, it's all right. I didn't have to, uh, time to talk about the 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 fourth <laughs> military junta that ruled. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Aside from this, though, um, please everybody do check out Historia Publica. Do check out Nina Neves' work. It is absolutely fantastic. All the links will be in the uh, description and information boxes. Um, please, uh, Ian, shout out anything you'd like. Let people know where they can find you, where they can watch and listen to your stuff. Yeah, I, I, I wish I could talk about this uh, more because we in Brazil, as we observed uh, people like Hakim, people like... Uh, I have to give credit to Hassan Abi too because he inspired me uh, in his format. Uh, we in Brazil decided not only to create uh, a Marxist-inspired uh, content in the internet, but we decided to to found a collective, a Marxist-Leninist collective, to do it uh, in an organized form. That's mm -hmm. why we can have a 50,000 member uh, Discord because we have a collective that is organized, that is centralized, that has militancy, uh, mm. which can make this type of thing possible. João Carvalho, which is the, uh, I believe, the next Brazilian uh, guest, is part of this movement, is part of our collective, and we are making something that we would like to inspire other parts of the world, which is work in the internet but in an organized fashion, which is something you guys are, are already doing. You got together, you, you started making a podcast. This is something, we are communists. We need to unite. The only thing we have is our organization, as Papa Lenin uh, teaches us. So mm. we, we would like to show everyone we, what we have been doing here in Brazil, organizing the movement in the internet to occupy this space and disputes the class consciousness of the internet, which is so uh, free and open for the rights to thrive. Uh, so if you want to follow my content, uh, all my social media is Historia Publica, which is public history in Portuguese, Historia Publica. And my collective is called Soberana, which, is, which means sovereign in, in Portuguese. Soberana has many content creators, all Brazilian content creators, and we try to occupy the internet, the Brazilian internet uh, overall, with a coordinated movement, a coordinated action. And we have been very, very, very successful. I would love to come here with my comrades so we can talk about this work that we have been doing in the internet mm. to bring people from the internet to the streets. We have been organizing movements and making... Uh, mass mass fronts and working with many things that internet makes possible. So I, I didn't have the opportunity to talk about this, but if you can look it up, Soberana in the social networks, and please please visit our Discord. I will leave the Discord link. It's discord.gg/soberana. We have a internationalism board there, a thread there, and we can speak in any language that you would like, uh, as long as we have people who communicate in that language. Uh, we have Arabic, we have French, we have uh, even Esperanto yeah. crazy people. <laughs> so The French is a mistake there. But <laughs> the uh, yeah, the French is a mistake. <laughs> uh, but but, uh, but that, that is, that's it, and I can't wait to see João come over. And, uh, he will. Don't and destroy my English because his English is much better. Than <laughs> <laughs> you were absolutely fantastic. And with all that being said, this has been the program. I'm Hakim. I'm Yugopnik. I'm JT. I'm Ian Nevis, and I hope no old lady comes shit in your toilets ever, ever. ever. <laughs> <laughs>